It's a catastrophic food shortage. The time to prepare for that is now. We must honestly acknowledge the circumstances we inherited. 94 million Americans are out of the labor force. Over 43 million people are now living in poverty. And over 43 million Americans are on food stamps. We're gonna have a heart attack in credit. Without credit, nothing gets done. Farmers can't plant, farmers can't uh, harvest. They can't ship it to the silo, the silo can't ship it. The, the, uh, the grain can't be manufactured into bread and then once it's bread, it can't get shipped to the final destination because every one of those operations involves credit. So when credit stops, you're gonna see a, uh, basically a seizure of, of all goods making it to markets. So there won't be goods available. And how big a crash could you be looking at? That'd be the worst in your lifetime. And the worst scenario for that would be things like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. This truck carrying corn flour and pasta never made it to the grocery store. Looting in Venezuela is on the rise. Each day at dusk, the unemployed converge on this sidewalk trash heap in downtown Caracas, picking through rotten fruit and vegetables tossed out by nearby shops. But it's not just the jobless that search through garbage for food. They're joined by many who still consider themselves part of Venezuela's middle class, even though their living standards have long declined, pulverized by triple-digit inflation, food shortages, and a collapsing currency. Lessons by expert preppers on storing up emergency food on a budget. Emergency foods are something that families, church and relief organizations, schools, institutions and food banks should be stocking up on nowadays, while it's still possible, while there's still food to be had. Our nation is sitting on a ticking time bomb and we unfortunately cannot tell exactly when this bomb is going to finally detonate. But we can hear it ticking louder with every passing year. Yet, no matter how frantically government and the military work to defuse the bomb, defusing this bomb continues to elude them. Of course, I'm using an analogy to describe some serious crap hitting the fan. When it does, we are looking at a famine on a level that this world has never seen before. Nationwide food shortages, and then, famine. No more food coming in from anywhere. What if the day comes where stores never reopen? At the point where your survival food stores become exhausted after several weeks following a collapse, you're either going to have to turn to begging for food or a very difficult and frustrating life trying to hunt fish, trap or forage in the adjacent forests called living off the land, but truly only the adept, the knowledgeable and the experienced are going to be able to live off the land. And the ones who do won't be found in any nearby woods or hills, because there won't be anything to hunt or forage for in the nearby woods or hills following a major disaster. Wildlife is very sensitive to the presence of people, so a large number of people fleeing into wilderness regions is going to send much of the wildlife fleeing for remote regions. It's these remote regions that the hunting can be good, but only the most adept are likely to make it that far, where there are no roads, where there may be rugged mountains and canyons and rivers to cross. There may be dangerous weather conditions to deal with depending on the season. If you can make it to a remote region, I'm talking really remote, it will be possible to live off the land, but it won't be easy. Are you just fine right where you're at? In a worst case scenario, we may see martial law, a government collapse, a civil war of sorts. Some of us should be stockpiling food. Some communities, some neighborhoods, some small towns and cities 
will likely make it through the first few months, following a collapse relatively fine. Others won't do so well and will be very dangerous places to live. You'll need some friends, you'll need some firepower. Hopefully God is on your side with all that firepower and he's going to use you in some way to make a difference for good. At one time, we were a nation under God, success after success, innovation after innovation, dreams and bigger dreams. America had God's favor and was the gem of the world. People from around the world dreamed of moving here and many did. But today, America no longer has God's favor. We have become God's enemy. Not all, but a lot of us. How long will your emergency food last? If disaster struck today, how long would your stockpile last? Careful, it's a trick question. I'm not asking how long you would be able to live off your stockpile. I'm asking about the actual shelf life of the foods in your basement or pantry. Though you may have beans and cereal to eat, in theory can last 10 years or more, the way you store them can substantially decrease or increase that amount. In other words, you may have quite a bit of food in your pantry right now. That is less than a year until it expires. And that's a tough position to be in if a serious, earth-shaking disaster struck today. The scoop on emergency food storage, extending the shelf life of several foods. Food storage done right, so you can double, triple, or even quadruple the shelf life of your foods. Let's talk about that for a moment. It all starts with the five food storage enemies, oxygen, moisture, temperature, light, and pests. The sixth one is time, but there's nothing we can do about that except rotating our stash. Now, if you're looking to get 10, 20, or even 30 years of shelf life off your foods, you need to tackle all of these enemies, no exception. Extending the shelf life of grains, beans, and rice. These are some of the foods with a long shelf life. Preppers like to stockpile that are also cheap. However, not all varieties are worthy to be in your stockpile. For example, Cheerios and other breakfast cereals you typically buy at the supermarket have a shelf life of six to eight months. Processed cereals have many refined and hydrogenated oils in them. Oils goes rancid, so even if you were to use the preservation techniques we're going to talk about in a minute, it still wouldn't be worth it. Thus, step one in storing your food for a really long time is to pick the right food. When we're talking about real long-term emergency food storage, opt for storing white rice, not brown, dried beans, and whole wheat berries, not breakfast cereals. Rice, beans, and wheat berries should be the staples of your survival stockpile. Mylar bags with oxygen absorbers for storing emergency food. The best way to store your emergency food is in mylar bags with oxygen absorbers. This is a no-fail combination used by most preppers. Provided your food is dry before you store it. Otherwise, you can wake up with condensation after you seal the package, which is not a good thing. The process is simple. You fill the bag nearly all the way to the top, seal it using an iron or a head straightener, but not before you add a pack of the oxygen absorber. Depending on the size of the bag, oxygen absorbers are small packs of iron powder and create a nitrogen environment by removing any oxygen present through chemical reactions. So, even if the bag will look like it's got air inside, you don't need to panic, because that's just nitrogen. It's worth mentioning that neither the nitrogen nor the iron powder can affect your food, provided you keep the O2 absorbers inside the original packaging. As you can see, you don't need to vacuum seal the bags. The absorbers will do the trick to prevent growth of aerobic pathogens, such as mold, as well as preventing oxidation. These are two ways oxygen can spoil your food. 
Besides, your cereals will crumble under the pressure of the bag. Put Mylar bags inside airtight BPA-free 5-gallon buckets. Next, you should put the Mylar bags inside airtight BPA-free 5-gallon buckets. This may seem unnecessary, but it's actually a good idea. First off, the bucket will shield the bags from the light, another declared food storage enemy, thus improving shelf life. Second, it protects the bag from accidental puncturing. We talked about aerobic bacteria, but anaerobes need very little or no oxygen to develop. The most important one is called Clostridium botulinum and is responsible for a disease called botulism, not something you want to suffer from post-collapse. Clostridium botulinum produces one of the most powerful neurotoxins that paralyze their host neuromuscular junctions. The spores are heat and acid resistant, so they are able to lie dormant for a long period of time. Once in the body, the bacteria releases the neurotoxin, botulinum, which remains activated even in gastric acid and proteolytic enzymes. The toxin is absorbed by the upper intestinal tract, enters the blood circulation, and finally finds its way to the peripheral nervous system. The neurotoxin botulinum prevents synaptic vesicles from secreting acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. The nerve endings are impaired and causes the individuals to experience paralysis. Fortunately, this doesn't really occur when storing grains, beans, and rice, as long as they're not moist. It's something that mostly shows up in canned food, which we'll tackle in a moment. The last thing you need to do after you've taken care of oxygen, light and humidity is ensure the proper temperature. Anywhere between 50 Fahrenheit and 70 Fahrenheit will work, preferably close to 50. If you do everything right, how long can food last in storage? What shelf life can you expect if you do everything right? This is pretty amazing. White rice can last at least 7 to 8 years, with some sources going as high as 25. Hard grains such as wheat and corn can store for at least 10 years. Soft grains can last about 8 years because the outer shell is not as strong as that of hard grains. Emergency food storage for pasta. Storing pasta for the long term is just as easy as storing beans or grain. If you read the label, they tell you it lasts for one to two years. But if you store it in mylar bags with oxygen absorbers, that shelf life can increase up to 10 times. That's 20 plus years in shelf life. Place it in plastic buckets to protect it from light, from crumbling inside, and from accidental puncturing of the bag. Speaking of punctures, you may want to consider storing things like spaghetti in 5mm bags instead of the more common 3.5mm to avoid any sharp noodles accidentally poking holes in the mylar. Some people like to freeze pasta before storage to prevent larva eggs from hatching. So, to kill these eggs, noodles shouldn't stay frozen for approximately 5 days. But this method is not needed as long as you use oxygen absorbers. Ultimately, freezing the noodles won't hurt them, but it won't really help either. If you decide to do it, you need to allow the frozen noodles to reach room temperature before you seal these noodles in mylas. Otherwise, condensation will form and allow the growth of mold. Canned food can last several years past its expiration date. There are a lot of myths about canned foods, and I want to burst the ones that have to do with shelf life. The one related to the expiration date. Food experts on shelf life have looked closely at unopened cans of food from several decades back, sometimes recovered from shipwrecks, and the data they found was a real eye-opener. Canned food can last several years 
plastic's expiration date, as long as the can has been properly stored and it looks good on the outside. It's not leaking and the lid is not swollen or punctured. It's probably safe to eat. You still have to check for suspicious smells, but there have been reports of canned food that was safe to eat even after 30 or 40 years. Nevertheless, plenty of people have reported being absolutely fine after eating canned food past the expiration date. Of course, you need to give your cans the same conditions you do to your beans and rice. Keep them in a cool, dry, dark place away from moisture. Now, there are two types of canned food when it comes to how long they last, high acidic and low acidic. The USDA guidelines tell us that high acid food, canned fruit or pickles, can last up to 18 months, while low acid food, canned meat, beans, corn, potatoes, etc., up to five years. The acid in these cans contributes to the deterioration of color, texture, and nutrients over time, of course. As mentioned earlier, if the can looks, smells, and tastes okay, you can ignore the expiration and the best buy dates in a post collapse. You might not have a choice anyway. Extending the shelf life of peanut butter. Peanut butter is jam-packed with calories and can last a long time if properly stored. But there's a catch. It's full of oils and, as previously said, oils go rancid over time. It depends which type of PB you're storing, because natural peanut butter only lasts a few months, while smooth and crunchy can last up to a year. To improve its shelf life, you need to keep peanut butter tightly sealed and in a cool, dry, dark place. You should also store it in a glass rather than a plastic jar to increase longevity even more. The alternative to PB is powdered peanut butter, which should store for at least five years, closer to 10 actually. And it's good for another year after you open it. That's considerably longer than traditional peanut butter. Food items with an indefinite shelf life. You've probably heard that honey has an indefinite shelf life. The only thing that can go wrong with it is crystallization, meaning the sugar molecules align themselves in a certain way. This is not a sign it went bad, but still, there's an easy fix. Place the open jar in a pot full of hot water and stir it until the crystals dissolve. In order to slow down the crystallization process, Simply store the honey at room temperature. Since most of your foods need to be in cool places, you can keep honey in your kitchen or pantry, where you probably have more space. The other items with an indefinite shelf life are salt, sugar, and molasses. But the one thing you should do is keep them away from moisture. It's common for basements to develop mold due to poor ventilation. So the two options you have are to either install a fan, if your basement has windows, a dehumidifier, which unfortunately will incur electricity costs, or use some of the other recommended options, depending on how bad things are. The Shelf Life of Seeds No long-term survival plan is complete without the seeds that will allow you to start a garden once the dust settles after a collapse. In a worst-case scenario, especially those who live in heavily populated areas, that may mean a long and difficult evacuation from a disaster-struck region. The good news about seats is that they don't take up a lot of space and you can transport them with relative ease when the time is right. Plant that garden finally. The most important thing to seed storage is to keep these seeds dry. Moisture is the biggest enemy. But fortunately, one you can easily defeat, keeping your seeds in a cool, dry place should work. And don't forget to add desiccants to the container and seal them afterwards. Another thing you need to do is dry them before storage. If you don't want to use desiccants, you have other options, such as putting them in paper envelopes. Other options include storing them inside the fridge or the freezer, 
but if you're left without power in the next disaster, you're still going to use one of the aforementioned solutions. The shelf life of various seeds varies. Some people say they can last up to 100 years. They actually found seeds inside the belly of a frozen mammoth, meaning they lasted thousands of years. It's hard to say, but if you do it right, you can expect to get at least five years of storage life and a 70% germination rate. The ones that have the longest shelf life are bean, two to three years. Radish, muskmelon, cress, collards and cucumber, five years. Tomato, squash, turnips, eggplant, sorrel, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts and watermelon, four years each. But again, the life of a seed can increase if you do a good job storing them. Emergency food storage for your pet. How to store dry and can pet food. There are essentially two types of pet food you can stockpile and they're the same ones you feed your pets every day. Dry and canned. Surprisingly, canned food lasts a lot longer than dry because dry food has a lot of fat in it which causes it to go rancid quickly. Dry food usually lasts a year, while canned food for two plus years. If you're thinking of using oxygen absorbers with dry pet food, it might not work. You might wake up with mold rings around the absorbers, which will, in turn, spoil the entire bag, as several preppers have cautioned. The good news about storing pet food, though, is that there's no difference between survival food and what they regularly eat for your pet. The other good news is that pets can eat human survival food, for lack of a better term. For example, dogs can eat white rice, which we already know can last a lot longer if properly stored, being one of the most popular survival foods. As long as you store your pet food in a cool, dry, dark place, such as a ventilated basement, you'll surely get a lot more than the one or two years it's stated to last. How temperature fluctuations affect emergency food. Before we wrap this up, I need to address an overlooked aspect, fluctuations in temperature. We said earlier that some foods need to be stored as temperatures between 50 Fahrenheit and 70 Fahrenheit, but that's only half of the story. The other half is that you need to keep temperature variations to a minimum because they too can negatively affect the shelf life, even if you keep it within the interval at all times. Fluctuations between 50 Fahrenheit and 70 Fahrenheit should be avoided. Why store up emergency food so you can survive during a famine? In the modern age, with so many grocery stores and restaurants bustling with activity and low prices, sometimes high, or many common food items, it's hard to imagine what life would be like if suddenly it all came to an end. Unfortunately, if someone were to pull the plug on interstate shipping and nationwide commercial food processing and commercial agriculture, literally overnight stores across several regions would slam shut their doors and before you knew it, the greatest disaster in America's history would unfold right before our eyes. Famine food shortages, long lines stretching possibly miles for a government handout, until the government closes its doors as well. Long lines seeking food at churches, that is, until churches run out of food, and soup kitchens, soup kitchens once popular with the homeless, but now attracting crowds of hungry and scared citizens and their families looking for food and also looking for a solution, but there won't be one. What about organizations like the Red Cross and Salvation Army? In some communities, in the first few hours and days, they may also be a source of food, but expect incredibly long lines. When or if food finally gets into your hands, unfortunately, it may not be something you really find that palatable. Food storage happens now, not later. It's a sad, unfortunate fact that there will be a day where tens of millions of people realize that so many signs about a coming catastrophe were all around them. 
but they were just too glued to their daily routines and complacency and stubbornness about life to notice. And it's not just the banksters at the top of the food chain, preying on the consumers or the super elites at the head of our corporations. No, it's the rest of us also. The people that make up modern day nations caught up in what the Bible describes as carnal, worldly lives, with a complete disregard for God and his warnings about that coming wrath on the world to deal with its many evils and atrocities. Atrocities are committed somewhere on our planet on a daily basis. Uh, harvest, they can't ship it to the silo, the silo can't ship it, the, the, uh, the grain can't be manufactured into bread and then once it's bread it can't get shipped to the final destination because every one of those operations involves credit. So when credit stops, you're gonna see a, uh, basically, a seizure of, of all goods making it to markets. So there won't be goods available. And how big? But it's not just the jobless that search through garbage for food. They're joined by many who still consider themselves part of Venezuela's middle class, even though their living standards have long declined, pulverized by triple-digit inflation, food shortages, and a collapsing currency. Lessons by expert preppers on storing up emergency food on a budget. Emergency foods are something that families, church, and... You get crashed if you do it. That'd be the worst in your lifetime. And the worst scenario for that would be things like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. This truck carrying corn flour and pasta never made it to the grocery store. Looting in Venezuela is on the rise. Each day at dusk, the unemployed converge on this sidewalk trash heap in downtown Caracas, picking through rotten fruit and vegetables tossed out by nearby shops. Relief organizations, schools, institutions and food banks should be stocking up on nowadays, while it's still possible, while there's still food to be had. Our nation is sitting on a ticking time bomb and we unfortunately cannot tell exactly when this bomb is going to finally detonate. But we can hear it ticking, louder with every passing year. Yet, no. It's a catastrophic food shortage. The time to prepare for that is now. We must honestly acknowledge the circumstances we inherited. 94 million Americans are out of the labor force. Over 43 million people are now living in poverty. And over 43 million Americans are on food stamps. We're gonna have a heart attack in credit. Without credit, nothing gets done. Farmers can't plant, farmers can't 